Welcome, Andy. Andy Tate, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, thanks. Thanks Thank, for having me. Of course. Thanks for being a part of the podcast. This is The Young Athletic. We talk mostly about youth sports in the area, in the 805, yeah. but you've got a, a huge, varied experience, so I thought you'd have, have you on and get to hear your side of the story. All right, yeah. Yeah, so talk, talk to us from the beginning. Uh, how did you get involved in sports? Did you play soccer? Did you coach soccer? Yeah, as I'll say <clears throat> by the accent. Hopefully, accent doesn't give it away. But <laughs> from England, yeah, I played. You know what I would think a pretty good high level. Uh -huh. But I grew up in a generation that's a lot different. Than different it is style today. of soccer. They're very different style. Um, also, a different process and a way of getting to an elite level. This is way this dates like pre academies and academies and yeah, yeah. six and seven year olds being associated with clubs. It was yeah, yeah. yeah what is here high school was was the thing you had to play school came first mm. and obviously everything from education but even in sports it came first so you didn't go off to clubs like mm -hmm. at six and seven well i feel like what i know about like english soccer or maybe european soccer is that they don't do like sports in schools they do sports at the clubs like at the, especially at the university level yeah am i just mistaken about that yeah a little bit it, it used to be it's, it's changed a lot now but okay because as, as schools have got um Sports got more varied. When I was at school, I did two sports. Yeah. Just I just did which um, ones? Which I did uh, soccer, football, and cricket. Cricket. So yeah. in the summertime, spring cricket, in the fall, winter soccer. And then when I went to what is known as high school, it was three sports: soccer, mm. rugby, and then uh, mm. and cricket. And that was really all. I was <clears throat> there were a couple of moments of of uh, athletics thrown in there, but really they were the three key sports. Yeah. But you didn't. You didn't go to a club or sign with a club. If I remember, you couldn't sign until you were like 14. Mm, okay. And that was the, known then as a schoolboy forms because you were still in school. Right. And uh, you could sign with clubs back then. But really that just meant you went odd practices, odd training sessions. Uh, but in the summertime, you'd go and do some training sessions with the coaches. Uh, but a lot of it was just a glorified try, uh, tryouts, if yeah. you like. And then when you were 16, then you could sign. Hmm, 16. So you played rugby, cricket, and football. And in school, yeah. But I, Which one did you like the most? Oh, I like, I like football, soccer the most, yeah. yeah. I was a better, probably a better rugby player at times, yeah. according to my dad. But I was fortunate enough to play at pretty high levels, all of those. For us, when I was growing up, it was, <clears throat> if you played for your school, that was kind of normal. And you had to, right? Yeah. Um, but this is... You play for your school, and then if you're good enough for your school, you play for your town. <clears throat> and if you're good enough for your town, you could play for your county or state, basically, as you yeah. call it here, which I did, both, both soccer and rugby. And then, you know, if you're good enough for that, you can go and play. You get into sort of the England camps where you can play as a schoolboy. And I, I, I played like, I played soccer at a pretty high level and did all those kind of trials and stuff like that. So what part of England are you from? I'm from the northwest of England. Okay. Which is... Um, What's the closest town for... Clo I'm actually from a small shipbuilding town. The closest big city is is um, is Manchester, probably. So are you a, a United supporter or a city supporter? I... I was a United supporter as a kid growing up. You know, a lot of people know, like, it's all by families. Okay. Um, though I am from the town that produced one of Liverpool's most famous players. Yeah. Which was uh, Emlyn Hughes. Okay. So he was known as Crazy Horse, Captain England. Um, would he lifted the European Cup a few times. Um, and right now, for, for, in more modern times... You know, when a friend of mine from my soccer days, his daughter plays for England for the women's team, uh, Georgia Stanway. Currently. So she's, yeah, currently, yeah. Oh, cool. So she's probably now the most famous soccer player out of Barrow. Wow. Um, so you were a United supporter then. What do you support now? <laughs> um, you know, I've just been listening to a lot of things on English radio about how you're allowed to change. I'm too old to change allegiances. But I actually... Through my career, I got to work with a lot of players and clubs and see things from an insider's perspective versus the fan on the sideline as a kid. And I saw, didn't really, I haven't changed allegiances in that sense, but I've got a better fondness like mm -hmm. for, you know, as an example, like um, I like, I think Arsene Wenger and his day changed. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. the game in England a lot. You know, when I was at that age, you go in at nine, kind of be done by one, and have your afternoon to figure out. A lot of players would just go to a snooker hall, a pool hall. They really wouldn't do anything afterwards. Hmm. And Venga changed a lot of that and made it more of a, it's a job. Like you go in at, you're going at nine, you don't leave till four or five. And you change diet, you change culture, you know, it changes how you physique, you, how you work. So he was ahead of his time in the preparation. Yeah, he, this was probably like early, this was for me, mid 90s, right? 96, 97. Yeah, that's when he came. And he did all that. And so that was, so I, again, sort of a fondness for that, you know, and obviously in my career, my work career, my life career, I worked, you know, different players and different clubs. So I started to see different sides of it. And I started to appreciate like the player and also kind of some styles of certain managers. But yeah, I'm still a Manchester United fan. Yeah. So let's talk about your work career. Um, product development yeah. for Reebok, for Nike, for Adidas, for yeah. all the big companies. Yeah, those How'd guys. you get into that? Oh, I totally got into that by accident. You know, and that goes a little back to what you were saying. I I um, I was a good. I felt I was a good enough player, but not quite good enough to to earn a living at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I did what a lot of kids do in England. Played in um, lower leagues. Uh, football and um, end up by a total accident getting a job with um, with Reebok but the, I, for me that job was oh if I get that job I can go and play in Hong Kong I could go to Australia mm. I could then maybe get to the US and play so I had this sort of like, everything centered around trying to play somewhere really and playing these like amateur leagues or professional leagues and get um, a little bit of money my two cousins played rugby and they were really good rugby players. So they had, they had similar ideas around rugby. They went to Australia and played rugby mm -hmm. and were given jobs right? and to fund rugby. Like yeah, yeah, one yeah. of them was a landscaper for a while. The other one was a milkman. They really didn't do that, but uh, yeah. it helped them. And I thought, oh, yeah, I could do that. So I. So that was your plan. That was my plan, my big time plan. Signed for Reebok. And, um, <laughs> and that job with Reebok took me to Korea. And I had no idea where Korea was. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, Most I people probably still don't. Still don't know. <laughs> Didn't look it up on a map. Yeah. Um, kind of had an idea that maybe it's a little bit like Hong Kong because it's in Asia. Mm -hmm. and it looks, seems like it's close. Uh, and I got there and was like, oh, it's, uh, it's not like that. It's very so, different. So what was it like? I, got, I went there pre-democracy. Pre so I got uh, there at a time where it was still a military dictatorship. Um, Koreans were not allowed to leave the country. Yeah. Um, you couldn't get a passport until the age of 54 unless you got spe wow. special dispensation. So walking in there as a Westerner, I uh, very was how did unique. How did Reebok get into Korea? <laughs> so they Is that where they manu they're, yeah. they're manufacturing it? They had a lot of manufacturing there. So okay. it, was a really, it was really, that's where manufacturing took off. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in the Far East for a lot of places. And it, Mass manufacturing yeah. and mass manufacturing of, of athletics. Another brand started coming in. So <clears throat> I lived in a s small town, but city actually about four or five million in the south that even saw less foreigners. And I was in a, that city had approximately, I think in my time, around 300 expats okay. or 300 foreigners. So out of a city of four or five million. So we stood out. Yeah, yeah. We really did stand out. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good learning curve. It's how I got into it. Um, and fortunately, I worked for a sports company, so I started really like it. You know, I live vicariously, but I got to touch um, other sports like yeah. basketball or tennis, uh, running, of course, and working for a company like Reebok back then, who was toe to toe with Nike. Mm -hmm. It was also very competitive. So it was kind of that sports environment. You know, you got to win, you know. You, yeah. Be winning through product, but you got to win, and there's a winning attitude to it. So I really liked it, and then that's how I kind of through that. I know being the English guy in the office, I developed some Reebok's early soccer product mm. out of Korea, like soccer cleats. Yeah, the boots and stuff like that. And then from that, from there, it carried on. I got did well enough to get into the U.S. and do the same thing with Reebok. So in the early days. Oh, gosh, we're talking like 92, 93. So would you say you, like, helped create 
the prototype for like a Reebok soccer cleat. Like oh yeah, for sure. One. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. really cool. Do you have it like? Do you still have it? Yeah, I have some old Reebok stuff. Yeah, I have like yeah. We did. Um, yeah, yeah. Me and a, there's a couple of guys that we we did it. We talk about it all the time. We put Reebok soccer back on the map. And if you want to go back and look, for those people that are listening, you can see things. Oh gosh, did we sponsor Tottenham? I think we sponsored Tottenham, West Ham. Uh, Liverpool, obviously, the big Liverpool days. We sponsored those teams. We had a big, deep bench of players. Ryan Giggs being famous, Valderrama. We, we, it, was, it was madness. But to give you a flavor of what it was like, that when I was there, we realized, you know, we, we, we couldn't, at that point, we, soccer boots were made in Italy. Okay. So everybody was making soccer boots of some sh- shape or form. Puma did some stuff out of Germany. Obviously, Adidas was making out of Germany. Um, but Diodora, Lotto, Umbro, yeah, uh, we're all coming out of um, <clears throat> we're all coming out of Italy. So, were they more expensive because yeah, they were coming out of Italy? More craftsmanship and 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 the way of working and how you built it, and there was there was techniques that um, were always obvious and people would know about that had been used for 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 many years. And what happened is. <clears throat> My the president of the company basically he told myself and a colleague go to Italy find a shoe factory to make soccer boots and don't come back until you have. Mm. So I had never gone. I'd never done that before. I'd never gone and just found a factory. Um, is, <laughs> so that's a whole. Can't other, look it up with your phone. <laughs> yeah, no, you come back then. So we, you know, we tried like word how of you, mouth. How do you find a, a factory? You just. You just kind of word of mouth. You ask a couple of people and you ask somebody um, in the industry, where do you make them? Yeah, we make them in Italy. What area do you make them? And then you go to your distributor in that country and you say, hey, I heard the Umbro makes uh, soccer boots in a shoe factory. Would you, could you find out where, what city? I heard it's in. They were making a thing in a town called Castle de Franco. Um, yeah, and they, somebody said, oh, we know another factory. We heard. It was all like word of mouth. I heard. Nobody mm-hmm. really knew. The, the owners and um, and we did we went to um, kind of northern Italy at the time and we were in the sort of uh, Venice-ish area sounds romantic but it's a little north of Venice okay. and we found some factories and I, I was ready to go come home I've been there about three weeks and we just had one more factory to go to and I was telling my colleague oh we got it these shoes look great we, 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 we've nailed it and he said we got one more factory near Milan and we went to this one factory that was very um mom and pop type factory. Actually, he was a father and his two sons. And that factory is called Brazilin. And gosh, the, their product was amazing. And we went there and we, from there on in, launched Reebok Soccer out of that factory and had boots for oh, Burkamp. out of that factory? Yeah, we did Burkamp's boots. We did all sorts of product for, the, for a, a whole slew, gigs, everybody. And so anything that Reebok made from... Latterly, the Sidewinders to the Kings, we did everything there. And it was, and we like to think, you know, based on, there's a small crew of us, it was myself, a designer, and a product marketing manager. We, think, we like to think we put Reebok Soccer back then on the map. We did some mm-hmm. crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. We showed up at the 94 World Cup oh, with, yeah. gosh, uh, Swedish na- Sweden, the national team there. And um, we did a lot of we did a lot of different things. We were the first guy. We did a pump soccer boot that was won in the World Cup finals. A pump soccer boot. What does that mean? So for those that know the pump soccer, a uh, pump basketball. And like you physically you, you push pump it up. We yeah, made a soccer boot, boot the same way. Oh yeah. Laceless, without without um, you know no laces, just slip it on. So you know, not bragging, but when you look today at some of the laceless soccer product. Um, again, the guy that designed some of this stuff, he's got a little bit of infamy in the industry. He, he, um, we were the first ones to do it. We did it in 94 World Cups, laceless soccer boot using pump technology. We even had a carbon fiber plate. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know they had carbon fiber back then. Yeah, it did, yeah. It was just coming on the floor with the bikes and stuff. So we kind of did that. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of launched from there. We had a good run with uh, doing that Reebok product. We did... Did a lot. We traveled, met a lot of people. We met <clears throat> old school people like Tom Finney, Bolton Wanderers, 
Bruce Rearch, obviously just mentioned, worked with Ryan Giggs. Mm -hmm. um, we were very fortunate to work with Jürgen Klinsmann, spent a lot of time with him mm -hmm. on his product, and he was an Adidas. Was he with the German national team at that yeah, point? Yeah, that's definitely, but for clubs you could wear whatever, unless, unless you happen to be um, tied to a club that was head to toe. Because mm -hmm. in early, early, through the 90s, do they do that? I, don't, yes. I never even realized that. Through the 90s, there was, there was, if you sponsored primarily European, it was head to toe. A little bit like the MLS is now, actually. is It was head to toe. So if you... So you have to wear yeah, the, too, men, the sponsor's gear and yeah. cleats and everything. So tied in. So there's a few clubs that were like that. Um, <clears throat> kind of changed in the 2000s as Nike got stronger. Nike came into it and sort of broke down. Sort of freedom of choice, if you like, freedom to wear whatever you wanted. Yeah. So they, they changed some of that. And um, when we worked with Jurgen Klinsmann, you know, he <clears throat> he kept other brands like Adidas on their toes because there was a brand out there that was you know, chasing them, right? Trying to do make a better product. So it, it was good for I think it was good for Adidas as well, because they would they had went through periods of being stale. But yeah, mm -hmm. we worked with um with Jurgen still have some Moments there, which was kind of fun when he played for Tottenham Hotspur in, in the uh, Spurs in the Premier League. And then, <clears throat> yeah, from there, just wanted to try something different, but ended up doing Nike soccer and, and started Nike soccer with them. They've been doing it for a while, but not they were not doing it very well. Yeah. So, quick quick recap. You went to Korea first with Reebok, yeah. then to Italy. Yeah. But you're still with Reebok in Italy. Yeah. And you're trying to come up with a new product, and you found this. Yeah father and son manufacturer that's making good stuff. Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. And then you're going to Nike. Then after that, after my Reebok days, and I think on my, my Reebok days, Reebok was crazy, right? It was, was, that, was that the longest like manufacturer you were with? Uh, no, not really. I think about the, same, about the same amount of time, Reebok and Nike. How, how long was Reebok? Uh, I spent eight years eight with years. Reebok, yeah. I liked it. It just, um, it just, we had a lot of success, but soccer's, for the most part, it's a, it's a buy-in game. You, you've got to have money to fund it. Mm -hmm. And the return sometimes on the investment is not super high. You know, it's not a business that... Um, so you don't have a lot of soccer boot manufacturers these days because you just... Those those brands are not really... Um, you know, it's not high margin, high profit business. Mm -hmm. And then actually, because... I like to think because I did such a great job at Reebok, I went over to Nike. And uh, Nike been doing their soccer product for a little while. But not it wasn't done well, mm, so we okay. re-engineered re that product. Um, so were you like going to Oregon at that point? Yeah, I went to Oregon. Yeah. I moved from Boston to Oregon, uh, re-engineered their product, um, and then actually that's probably where we we, for me at least, getting Reebok going is like classic leather kangaroo, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, which the good allowed, stuff. Which we're allowed to do back then, um, but moving over to Nike changed it. We changed. We I like to think that. We changed that kind of paradigm a little bit, developed the first Mercurials. Oh, yeah? Yeah, did the first Total 90s. So Total 90, Reebok back when we were, sorry, Nike, it was, um, we had bucket three buckets of your classic, so your timeless classic player, right? Then we had your, your fast Mercurial type. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we had a guy that went for, for 90 minutes, played all day long. So if you think, visualize back then, I think I, I can't remember our timeless classics. You never never want to label a player as a timeless classic. Yeah. But, you know, Mercurial Fast with Ronaldo, the right. The Ronaldo with the bad those haircut. Are, those are popular cleats. Yeah. The Mercurials, I remember. Yeah, and then we did, um, and Total 90 was like a Edgar Davids, guy that went all day long. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of other players, they just wouldn't just your ho hum every day. I say ho hum, but they were just just strong classic players, they would tend to be a premier player. Mm -hmm. Because every player thinks he's either running running full out for 90 minutes or he's super fast. And so we we, um, we had a lot of fun with that. But that was the time when the, for me, that's when science came into it all. So we talk about, you know. Science? So, yeah, science. So Like research and development? Yeah, and, we, we did. Okay. Typically making boots, I used to go through this idea of, Get your boots, sit in the bathtub, warm water, make them fit. Um, 
Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. You wear them in the shower. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah, other yeah. like. You know. I don't know if people still do that. I don't know if they recommend doing that or not. I don't think so. No, <laughs> there was other other crazy ones that you could other crazy techniques that came out, but you you could do all these different things, and they were just very simple. They were very. It was like multi-studded. Uh, there was what we used to call back then screw-ins, replaceables. Yeah. That since became soft ground, firm ground. Right. Different surfaces, and you'd have turfs for like maybe um, harder surfaces. So that was really it, and uh, that was about the length and breadth of research. If as long as you did those kind of products, you were good to go. But as we got into the sports, especially working for Nike, put a lot more science into it. So it was, the science there was a lot around uh, weight, being lighter, therefore the player. It just basics, but could be lighter, could be faster. Right. Well, I think, um, what's his name? Bill Bowerman. Yeah. Um, you know, the Oregon track coach and co-founder of Nike. I've been a big fan of his for a long time, and he's always been about, like, have lighter shoes, you know, takes yeah. takes um, a percentage off a longer run. Yeah. And so I wonder if that's just built into the DNA of Nike, is that kind of research to improve? Yeah, and the way the research was back then is um, to make the athlete better. Right. right? And, it was, and generally to make the athlete better was to be faster, right? If you like faster, quicker, to perform better, you know? So when we did Mercurials, we, we worked through, that was the first time that we really tried to um, implore some of those kind of techniques. So what did you do to test out the Mercurials? I mean, <laughs> that must have been a fun process. Yeah, it was a, it was a crazy fun process. Because it's like the lightest shoe, right, at that point. Yeah, so we, we decided we decided it would be the lightest shoe. So we looked at other Whose brands. idea was that? Was that your idea? No, I was sure. <laughs> I kind of, also, it was a collective amongst all of us to get to be the lightest. And, and we what would what could you do that was different? So back then, you know, our competition, competition we... we we recognized that we needed, we recognized we couldn't make another, we couldn't make a Copa because it was so entrenched. Our I love Copa. the Copas. Yeah. They were so entrenched. In the the in Copa the, America, for people who don't know, yeah. classic black and white kangaroo leather. Yeah. And it, and it was also a super like, neutral shoe. Yeah. And built in a certain way in a certain different type of manufacturing techniques that was kind of expensive to buy, buy into. Mm -hmm. And so they, they had a niche there, right? And we recognized. We just need to give somebody a boot they could wear. If they didn't like the fancy boot from Nike, then they could at least wear something else that we had, which was a Premier. But we then got to a place where we said, no, nah, we need to do something that's just different, that's completely unexpected, that's completely out there, that works. And um, that's where the Mercurial came from, and we said it'd be the lightest. So we looked at those boots, and you remember they all had fold-over tongues? It was the big yeah, deal, right? Yeah. Everybody told us, you've got to have a fold-over tongue, because it's iconic. And we started to recognize that certain things are iconic. Puma had the white, Puma Kings had a white fold over. Mm -hmm. You'd always know an Adidas from the white back tab, the white notch on the back. So we looked and said, no, we'll take the tongue off. We'll make, we won't have a fold over tongue. Wow. We'll, Revolutionary. Uh, yeah, but it's kind of crazy. We saved <laughs> some weight. And then we started looking at materials. <clears throat> Leather gets wet. So friend, the guy that I worked with there, we'd both come out of Reebok. We'd played a lot with synthetics. Mm-hmm. So synthetics was, they don't mold, what, they don't do this, they don't do that. But we went out and f briefed out with that, with that Nike team. We want a synthetic because it's lighter. It doesn't absorb water, so it's lighter. So we did that. Then we looked at stud configuration. And it came at a time when on the heels of Predators were out there. But they had a little bit of a knock that they were maybe some injury issues. Um, for those who um, remember that far back, Alex Ferguson, Sir Alex, right. actually... Banned him. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he didn't want these I players. I thought Beckham wore Predators. He did, yeah, but he wore a modified version. Okay. And so he did want them banned because he felt there were injuries to his players. Because of the studs? Yeah, because it used to be called blades. They translated into a blade stud configuration. But we looked at that. We looked at uh, a smaller, more rounded stud configuration. We went to a thinner plate for more flexibility so the player could move faster and quicker. We did a lot of things that were different, and we got, we got to a lighter boot, which you know, I, we, we, we all maintain, because we did it, yeah. that it, was, it changed the game of technology. But in that process of what it did is we, we started to work with players, and we did pressure mapping because of studs, and we found out in, in some countries 
families could only afford a particular type of boot. You can't buy three boots, right? You can buy one. Right. And they would buy, for soft, muddy grounds, they would buy um, what we call screw-ins, which is like <clears throat> you're screwing in something into your feet and then you're getting bone bruises. Mm. So that led in, it's like, how do we do something that gives you traction? So you start to see all that science coming out of how do we get traction, how do we get mobility? You know, we, we did all these kind of things and Nike was really good at it. We worked with, yeah, a lot of players. We worked with goalkeepers. We worked with, uh, um, like I said, uh, Ronaldo, uh, Davids. Oh, we get so much access to so many different players that it was a really easy, seamless process. When you say access to players, do you mean like you as the Nike rep would go take a couple of couple yeah. of boots over to the training club and yeah. have them try them on? Yeah, I spent a lot of time with 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 um, I spent a lot of time with national teams. Back then, I spent a lot of time with the Brazilian national team. On the Brazilian players, national team? Because they had Ronaldo, Romero, uh, Romario, Dunga, uh, gosh, um, Roberto Carlos, yeah, he was there in and around them when he scored that famous goal in Lyon in the France World Cup, his free kick. His uh, <coughs> left footed yeah, around the ball. Around the ball. And yeah, we had access to those. I worked. To was he wearing Nikes? Yeah, he was wearing Nikes. There you go. Yeah, he was wearing Nikes, yeah. <laughs> and then Ladley, and then I also spent a lot of time with the women's national team, working with uh, Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy. Uh, Christine Lilly was actually, has always been and is a, an Adidas um, mm -hmm. athlete. But Nike had uh, most of those players locked up. Milbert, McMillan. Gosh, I can't remember. So you got to spend time with these players? Yeah, I spent a lot of time with those players, yeah. Brandy Chastain, all those guys, yeah, went to... Fortunate to work with them on product. Um, we would try hard at that point to get very women specific. When it was, I think in the late 90s, there was a turning point. But where I think it's documented in some of their, their documentaries where they talk about they were just given women, men's shorts in a smaller size and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It didn't work and didn't function. So we, you know, we looked at that through a footwear lens and we tried to do some women's specific footwear product. And yeah, we, we, it was a lot of fun, yeah. Went to work with him on the World Cup final. So and, how how long did it take to develop the material? Uh, the material, how long did it take? Um, like two years, five years, no, ten it, months? We, we kind of knocked it out in about 18 months. Yeah? Yeah, it was, everything was unique. We, we, we made that one in Italy. Um, we ended up doing that in... Uh, it was manufactured in Italy. Yeah, it was manufactured in Italy, but because we used different materials, we moved away from um, kangaroo. We're using uh, synthetic, synthetic right. from a uh, material. We had a print on it, which, which we tried to look at ball control. So for those, again, predators were a rubberized insert that uh, Craig Johnson had developed as a training aid initially. It's the predators at Beckham War from more spin and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we decided that, well, maybe there was a coating that you could put on the ball. So, and when you look at the material and the original one with the wavy lines, we looked at those as the high ball strike areas. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to have a tactile print on there that would both be tactile when wet and dry. So those, those prints were done in a motorcycle accessories factory in Italy. Wow. So it was kind of funny to go in there and see, um, it was the Vespa, they made the accessories for Vespas. So you'd see these body parts of Vespas going by overhead, going around, and then, <laughs> Then these uppers, these parts of shoes, we saw go by right next to them. Yeah. But so that was we we took learnings from motorcycle factory process and put that into um, and put that into uh, product. And then tall nineties, which was the all the guy we said went for ninety minutes. Our early adopters uh, was Oliver Bierhoff. He um, he actually, funnily enough, we used to test with elite players. But not, um, obviously, anyone who's playing professionally is elite, right? But sort of, let's call him A minus. And at one point, he was like, an A minus. He played for Udinese in Italy. He didn't mm -hmm. play for um, like in, uh, Milan or Juventus. But he was the first guy to score in a pair of total 90s. Nice. Other players obviously followed, but then we worked with Figo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's interesting. I mean, a side note to that one is, I was, Figo played for Barcelona. 
Obviously, we go over to Barcelona and work with Figo. So you get to sit and watch and embrace all of that. Bobby Robson at the time was the coach. Bobby Robson's assistant slash translator was Jose Mourinho. So wow. it was when we worked with product with Figo, Jose Portuguese, Figo Portuguese. So he helped navigate that for us. Little I did I know I was sitting with... Yeah, Jose legends. <laughs> back in those days. But yeah, so it's all these little anecdotal things pop up. So I'm pretty privileged to have had that experience. So what was that like? I mean, like, what was it like to be at Barcelona with... What was, the, like, the soccer like? What was the environment like? What was the coaching like? You know, what did you learn from that experience? So that, so that what you started, what you learned first and foremost, first thing you learned was, like, which is different. So I can sort of compare to it. I'll use England as a, as a... England against, we'll say, teams that then, Barcelona versus, versus say, English teams. So they, they were very um, aware of what it took to be a professional. Barcelona yeah. players. So not only was it the diet, they used to take care of the, the diet and their lifestyle, right? Uh -huh. So they were very, you know, sounds well, silly, but like, if I'm tired, I'm going to take a nap. You know, they, they really, their science of things was if you're tired, you could get injured. Uh -huh. The reverse of that in England was if you're tired, work harder, run more. Yeah, yeah. Right? They were like, if I'm tired... I'll listen to the body, take a nap. You know, and science will catch up to that, as we know today. But back then, you know, we're talking 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they, they, they had that down. And then their, their way of playing was, was a lot different. I don't know if it, I actually sometimes joke with people, it's too hot to chase the ball all day. So they would just pass the ball. <laughs> And move the ball around. It's it's hotter in Spain than yeah, England. But I don't think that's really the case. They, they, you know, a lot of that changed later on. But they played a different style. But they were fitter. They were fitter, less injuries, and they moved the ball in training, and worked as a team. So they were obviously England was dominated by long ball. Yeah, yeah. Which I got to learn as a young kid that came out of crazy studies that they did. You know, and I, I like like what. When I was a kid, and I played, for, I played um, like basically played for my. I was playing for my county, my state. Yeah. Um, and I got to play for the north of England, and they at that time said the coach was an English FA coach, and so we had when we watched film, he shows a film of Brazil, from uh, <clears throat> that would have been probably from '78 World Cup, and they're moving the ball around, passing it everywhere, you know, and, and he actually can't look how many passes it's taken for them to get a shot on goal. It took him 28 passes. And he said, well, that's a complete waste of time. Because we, <laughs> that's what he said. Is, it's a complete that's waste of time. That's what your coach said. That's what the English FA coach said. It's a complete that's waste really of time. That's really funny. Because all goals are scored at the POMO position, the position of most opportunity, and that's the back post. So, okay. Okay. hence, you, they, in England had long throw-ins with flick-ons. To, to get to the back post. To get to the back post. And if you were... And if you were, um, as I did, I played then right back and center back. You had to, you had to very get that ball forward. Every team had a big center forward whose job was to hold it up, knock it out wide, and run get, it, get in for the cross, and then get in for the cross. Yeah, and it yeah. had to be one, two, three, maybe four passes max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really difficult because as a kid, I spent time in, uh, under coaches that were passing coaches. So when you go back to that club. You've, you you don't you're a little bit confused as a kid like you know remember so, tell, telling the coaches like I, I, so you when you were younger your your teams were more pass oriented and when yeah. you got older they said just go quickly and go for the long ball yeah I was fortunate enough to be around you know coaches that've been influenced by Brian Clough who was very was a passing coach mm -hmm. and what you know to look after the ball he was famous for his speeches about taking care of the ball and. You know, you can read in different books about him putting towels down <clears throat> and then putting the ball on a towel and saying, this is precious. If you lose it, <laughs> you go get it back, treat it like your child, all that kind of stuff. So I, one of the very few teams that I was fortunate enough to play with, they, they had that style, so it's kind of confusing. But anyway. So Barcelona, where are the cool places have you been? I mean, obviously, we've just started the stories, really. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been in a lot of different places. I've been, um, I spent time with the Brazilian national team in the training centers. Down in Brazil. Down in Brazil, yeah. And Rio, probably. Oh, Is that you know, it's a little outside of. It's not. It's outside of Rio. It's away from. It's away from 
the major city centers, the name escapes me. It's a compound they have. Okay. They take players to. It's predominantly isolated. Okay. Um, just be, really because fans are so crazy, you need to isolate the players, and it was a focus. But I would say that, like, the misnomer, well, I guess it's not a misnomer, but the misnomer was for the longest time, the guys were super skillful, they didn't really care, they were part, sort of party guys, and they were just really skillful. But actually, no, they worked incredibly hard. They yeah. Were, they were hard-working players. They were incredibly skillful, but they were all very hard-working, dedicated, top professionals. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that they were born with, they were born with skills, but lots of players are born with skill. Yeah. They, they worked hard at it very much. Where do you think that stereotype, st- stereotype came from? I think it's just from the style of play that they had. You know, yeah. back then they saw a samba, play to a beat, play to a music, uh, play to a tempo. And and they did, but if you and if you sort of look at them and how they enjoyed winning, and how they celebrated, it looked like they were just just having a good time. And maybe these guys so were people. Yeah, yeah. They but, misinterpreted that. Yeah, but no, they were they were they were really really hard working yeah. guys, and they're also archetypal for a lot of clubs today, where they you know they look at that and say these are guys that work hard, and you see the opposite kind of. <clears throat> of Brazilian players coming into leagues now having to kind of up their standards mm. to, to meet that line of level. But I, you asked me about the, <clears throat> going back to the women's national team, you know, like, and you see today how they have kind of, um, they say the rest of the world is catching up, right? The Alexia Lalas thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he's right, but I think the thing that the rest of the world is catching up to was fitness. When, mm. I, when I worked with the women's national team, they're incredibly fit. They were insane. Um, and we'd have tra- they would have their training camps. And when, within their training camp, you, didn't, you couldn't start training camp unless you passed the fitness test. And what was the fitness test? Oh, I can't remember? remember the fitness test, but I can, I can tell you that it was incredibly hard. Yeah. It involved a lot of running. Yeah. Once you passed that, and if you didn't pass the fitness test, you would drop from the squad. Oh, really? Yeah, you weren't. Um, it wasn't well, like, oh, you know, try to get fitter in the next couple of days through tra- training camp. No, you were, you were gone. It was it was super serious. Yeah, you had to pass it, and and consequently, those girls kept themselves and those women in incredibly great shape. So when they showed up against teams that weren't as fit as them, that's where I felt they were always dominated. And you could see it in other games. They just they could outrun, outplay, and had more stamina than anyone else. Now today, everyone everyone everyone's, everyone's called that part up. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've all got a lot more professional. So yeah. So you think that'd be the biggest difference between. Oh yeah, the women's team from you know yeah. ten twenty years ago to now. Yeah, they always say there's obviously players you know whether it's Mia Hamm or Julie Foudy or Brandy Chastain or Christine Lilly. The list goes on of the people they talk about that that were game changers. And they were they were they were good they were good players like Michelle Akers and people like that. They were good. They were really good players for the, at, at that time. Um, but there were other players that came out that, around the same time that was. That were strong and technically good, they just weren't as fit. Because hmm. they weren't in a system, didn't have colleges, didn't have clubs, and you can see that changing now. Yeah. <clears throat> when I think of Mia Ham, I always just think of like someone who'd do anything, you know, to just sacrifice for the team. But Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. From what I remember and from a time there, not not really she was definitely the best player on the team. Who didn't want anyone to know she was the best part of the team, and she was like humble. She yeah, humble. super humble. Yeah, probably yeah. one of the most humble people I've ever met. Like almost, almost to a point of shy. Yeah. And, but she didn't. She put team first. Yeah, yeah. She was super good, and you can see it now in life, right? She hasn't sort of faded away per se, but she hasn't gone looking after it and chasing after the spotlight. And she never was when she was that. She always put team first. It, it was a good role model for a lot of people today. Yeah, she was a good leader. Yeah, yeah. Super good leader good, yeah. on the team. Same with Julie Foudy, right? Julie Foudy was really strong. Yeah, I can remember having, when I worked for... I knew Julie Foudy from Reebok, because Reebok, their policy was we could get one or two players, we could afford sponsorships and things like that. So I got to work with Julie Foudy on a lot of product for, for a long time um, and, and kind of knew her a little bit. But uh, and I remember when I went for Nike, I had to go and ask. She was the captain of the national team, and we had some product and we wanted to work with Mia and some players. And asking, first asking Mia, hey, have you got thirty minutes to come and put some product on, knock some balls around, give us some feedback? And Mia saying, well, you, you, I got 
you're going to have to ask Julie. She's the captain. Mm. If we have time, then you go to Julie. Hey, Julie, do we have time? Can we do this? As the captain, you know, really asking, not email asking her to her face. Julie saying, you got 20 minutes because we've got a meeting in 30, right? So the, the, it was, she was, she was mm -hmm. a strong captain as well. What is a, um, a sponsorship for a player like? Like when you say you worked with Julie, with Reebok, you sponsored her. What was that like back those? Back in those days, um, like a free kit, money, like I, yeah, I don't know what it was like. Different people did different things, but yeah. for the most part, I mean, most were chasing money, right? In some some way, shape, or form. Julie was a was a Reebok. She became Reebok ambassador at, at that point, okay. so she covered across women's sports. But ninety nine percent, I've got some money and some product is usually the deal. Um, and you did that with a lot of different athletes? Yeah. With Reebok, with Nike, with yeah. Adidas? Yeah, Nike, I worked with, same thing in Nike, um, with lots of players around globally they, they had access to, na men's national team, what was it, Kobe Jones, Tab Ramos, mm -hmm. that group of players, Preki, all those, um, those guys, and they were all in the same, they got product, they got, oh, typically my. most, get mer they call merchant merch deals, where they... They can order a certain amount of product, usually depending five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand. I think now they just get an account number and they can just go shopping on their own. But it used to be that <coughs> they could go and order product and just get it shipped to the shipped to them. It was usually the way, way it worked. It could be any product they wanted. Yeah, because like I'm not involved in the professional sports world. I'm with youth sports, so I don't really think of sponsorships. But nowadays, you can sponsor. Are you familiar with the NIL stuff? A little bit, the name and likeness stuff. A yeah. little bit, only only on the outside because when we worked with, when we worked uh, on product in the U.S., you know, the first place you want to go to if you can't access, if I want to test something and I can't access, like I'll go to a college, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem was the NC2A rules. So you had to be very careful around the, some of those rules. Yeah, so if yeah. you gave them product, we were gifting them something of value. So you, you had to make that. sure it came back. Yeah, yeah. So there are little things like that. You couldn't give them a T-shirt. You couldn't give them anything. Yeah, you couldn't buy them lunch. You know, it was really, really odd. Strict. Strict way. But now with their, na their name, image, image, and likeness, they can use that to fund money. And have you done anything like that? I haven't done any name, image, image and likeness stuff. I know through family, friends, some... People that are on it uh, had those kind of deals. As as the athlete or as the sponsor? As the athlete. As the athlete. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but generally, it's, I don't, right now. That's what I want to do here. I want to, you know, write up a contract that's valid, that's not going to make anyone lose their eligibility to play soccer. Yeah. Because you can do it for high school sports in California. Yeah. And, and college, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do that at some point down the line. Yeah, it's getting it's getting the value of. <clears throat> I would imagine any athletic director would know around these schools around here about around them in image and likeness. Yeah, because for them, you know, it's using an athlete who's going to get payment based on the hits, the social hits, yeah. or what they can drive revenue to the school because it, it's clicks as they say now right mm -hmm. and what, how many clicks you can get for doing something good or bad that's the other side of it right yeah it's, there's, there's, it's not always just a purity route of you're a stand up person yeah I think Dion Sanders is a good example of it he's getting a lot of clicks as they say right and drawing attention to Colorado mm -hmm. right so as long as you can keep those clicks going Colorado is going to be super happy yeah I mean I, I think like their enrollment's way up yeah which yeah. is, you know, it's working, I guess. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But yeah, I was going to, so like that was, I, from all my soccer stuff and worked on that kind of thing. And what I see and what I know now, because I still do performance product, but, but back then when we tested, we tested to make the athlete, like I said, could it be faster, could it be quicker, right? And there were some parameters around, um, we weren't affecting the athlete's biomechanics, Right. We wanted product that wouldn't inhibit their biomechanics. Mm -hmm. So that means if the, if the shoe's too stiff, your foot's not bending, right? Um, your foot doesn't bend that much, by the way, but you know, it doesn't bend to create propulsion. 
But we, we were just thinking on those lines, wait, you know, if the shoe was lighter. Because like now, there's a lot of players, will, you know, it's started to come around that they'll change their, they'll change their whole kit at half time if it's wet. Yeah. You know, we used to do that, right? Yeah. You know, some then put a change in the shirt. And then the technology goes, right? How does the, how does a shirt, you know, expand It's nice moisture? to have a dry shirt. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so there was all those Nothing kind wrong of, with that. But all those kind of things were going on. But now it's, now where things are really changing is <clears throat> into um, the performance, how the athlete can perform at the highest level. And so there's a lot of stuff popping up where places are setting themselves up. There's a place in Santa Barbara that works with athletes right now, young athletes. No, to, to do what? To, to improve their performance. Okay. And, and their biomechanics. So, um, and it could be something, and a lot of it's around, a good example would be um, if you see somebody, like a quarterback throwing a ball, right? So you obviously you have coaches that talk about mechanics, right? Right. And they change all the mechanics so you can throw the ball further, right? But what about, because that's what that coach knows, but if you study the biomechanics and data around that, is that throwing technique going to create shoulder injuries? Mm. Therefore, that quarterback is longevity is being shortened. Right. So then you look at those that data points to now say, how do I change that throwing technique so, so they can throw the ball further, say, or more accurately, but they can have more longevity. And so we, we've seen that with basketball players now. So how do they... If they, for example, how they stop on the court and how they cut. So then you look at that and you may see an athlete that does certain things and you say, well, if you continue to do that, you're going to have knee problems. Mm. So you're going to have to learn how to land. Mm. If you learn how to land properly, then you will, ex- you will have a longer career. So you can, those things are coming... So are you specifically involved in that? Yeah, do some of that stuff right now if, okay. on a basketball front right now. On a basketball front. Yeah, so, but, it, it, but that, though it's happening in soccer. The same thing's happening in soccer, baseball, football, a lot of any athlete, and happening with a younger age as well. So part of this is, <clears throat> obviously we all know if you train, right, you can get lighter, you can get faster, you can do certain things. So you're training your body, right? training your muscles, fast twitch muscles and things like that. But you're not really, you need to take a holistic approach to it and say, now if I put a pair of shoes on, so if, I'll give you an example, good simple example. Probably kids who think about training, they'll go, soccer kids right right now, okay. they'll go out and train in a pair of trainers, right? I've got a pair of running shoes on, I'll go and do my running, I wanna get off season, and I'll do all this off season work, I'll go to the gym, trainers, right? I'll do all that. But you don't play in trainers. Right. You're playing a different product. So you want to do all that training in the product you're playing. So mm. this is what you see. You see it, even at professional clubs, you see the same kind of thing. Their bike work and stuff, yeah, they'll ride a bike, they'll do certain things, but they spend a lot of time on the field in the product that they're, in, they're going to wear because that's where you get your biggest impact. Yeah, you can build muscle density, you can do all that kind of stuff, but you need to from an injury perspective, make sure you're wearing the product. So is that more of what you're doing now, the biomechanics versus the product yeah. development? Yeah. Okay. So those two things coming together. So in the early days, it was really, like I said, trying to get product together. And it's been in the last, uh, you know, people could uh, probably say 15, 20 years, this collision of biomechanics and science coming together. With the product. With the product. So way more science of uh, and human physiology coming into it so you marry the two together so you know you, for a lot of people like there used to be what was it um what are those shoes that zero they used to call it drops where you were flat barefoot running was a thing oh right? yeah <clears throat> so, the Nike freeze yeah so there's barefoot was running. that you no it wasn't me <laughs> but it's barefoot running you have barefoot running um and they would talk about human evolution and all this kind of stuff mm-hmm. but then people said look at that Again, it was, really? How do I validate that, right? How do I prove it? So the science all starts to come into it. Um, unfortunately, it, it, to some extent, there is merit to it, but also we all have to remember that, you know, if you were, if you were barefoot all day long from the day you were born, yeah, okay, yeah. then, yeah, you're probably okay. But if you're wearing a pair of trainers, this is what I tried to say before, 
for everyday life, walking around, practicing, and you decide to go for a jog around the block in a um, barefoot, you're going to hurt yourself. Mm. Your muscles are going to stretch in different ways, and you're going to get hurt. And that that's why the sort of barefoot running thing kind of yeah, it's dwindled. not yeah, it's had not there anymore. Yeah, because you don't live your whole life barefoot. Barefoot. Yeah. What would you say is like some of the biggest misconceptions about the those biomechanics that like that we just missed on, like the barefoot running. Uh, barefoot running is one of them. Yeah. There's a lot of talk around, like, they talk about um, different people talk about drops and heel heights in products, so, or offsets is another word. So that means... Um, what do you think about the hokas? Do they, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know. Those I running know. shoes that, like, yeah. sort of push you forward? Yeah, push you forward, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a few brands that do... Yeah, they're good They're good because you can wear that all day long, so you're starting to condition your muscles. Yeah. So... If again, where they've had successes, you can wear that all day long. Mm -hmm. So their successes, initially, you know, like orthopedics like them because um, they do have that max cushioning. Yeah, they're They're, like pillows. They're like pillows. You've just got to wait. Be very careful that everything for every reaction, there's there's an opposite. Yeah. And uh, if it's unstable, and you, then you got to think about your knees and your hips. But general, you're in it all day. You start to condition your body. So um, it means, what that means is, if it's wobbly, you start to strengthen muscles you didn't know you needed to strengthen. So I'd yeah. imagine if you were wearing, if you were wearing a shoe that never had max cushioning, you never wore max cushion shoes, and you put them on, I imagine you'd feel super comfy. I imagine if you wore them all day for a few days, you might feel tired. Because you're not used to it. Because you're not used to it, and you probably would feel stra- um, tightness in areas you didn't know you would feel. Because that's your body reacting to that and muscles you didn't know you'd have to use. Yeah. So it's just a case of like getting into it. And that's the thing you, you always remember when you move, make that move. But because hokers is one. Like Anyway, the offset thing I was going to tell you was <clears throat> is how high your heel's off the ground. Okay. So if, if you wear a soccer product, your heel's flat. You're pretty much flat, one with the ground type of thing. Um, if you wear a pair of running shoes, you offset, so your heels lifted up about ten millimeters. So again, it's that same thing. If you haven't, you were to go and pair, put a pair of soccer boots on and walk, walk around in them, or play in them, you, and you'd never worn them before, you're probably going to start to feel mm. tightness in your Achilles, tightness in your calves, that kind of stuff, just because your heel dropped down. So there's. So I think the big miss has been trying to convince, one of the misses has been trying to get people to <clears throat> buy into, oh, you could be zero, you could be four millimeters and drop you down more. Because again, people aren't used to it. Now that we're trending back to <laughs> six to eight has been a kind of trend. Six to eight. Offsets, Offset. yeah. Offset. Yeah. That's the standard? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. If you're performance-based, yeah. Uh, let's take it. Let's bring it all back to youth sports. What's the uh, what's your evaluation of like player development, coaching development, facility development? You know, here abroad, wherever you've experienced it. Yeah, I think I think the thing what I've what, what I've learned through this is, um, and I'll say the biggest difference is when we when growing up in in England, you know, you're playing you you're playing a sport. And you coached, and the, even though the coach has a little bit of differences, the coaches, it's kind of a national standard, so to speak, right? Um, technique, movement, it's not a win at all costs mm-hmm. environment because there's no money. It's just that, it's not to say, we can't say it's just dads, but it's people who've got coaching licenses. But I didn't pay money, my parents never paid for me to play. Yeah. You know, don't today. I think what's happening in the US, obviously, <clears throat> definitely is a money thing for a lot of coaches. You can make money, you can make a livelihood at it, and fair, fair game to them for doing all that. I think the change I've seen is now with academies and with MLS and all that kind of stuff, you're starting to see a focus on the US game, right? And if, if clubs want to be successful, the national team wants to be successful, they have to have an influence on the game at a grassroots level. And what you see is, and I'll see that 
I'm not a split, not 50-50, but you can see clubs have a win at all costs. And I'm, I'm lucky because I've got kids that play. So I see a win at all costs mentality, and I see a developmental mentality. In some clubs, you see that, um, and you also see the win at all costs. I think, you know, as a personal, developmental is more important than the win at all costs side of it because, you know, we don't know at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe ten we do, but if we have the next Messi, right? But, you know, like, um, I use the argument, one of the arguments I've been talking with on a coach, Coach Pat, is that those who follow soccer, right, Jude Bellingham, right? So if you follow that, and I'll give you, like, the example I give, we talk about is, um, <clears throat> he's like probably going to say he might win the Ballon d'Or in the next year or two, right? And he's 19, 20 years old. He came from Birmingham, right? So he's, Birmingham signed him at 14. Mm -hmm. Trent Alexander-Arnold was at Liverpool from the age of five mm -hmm. or six. So this, Birmingham is not a big club. <laughs> they've had a lot of problems. They're getting a bit of notoriety right now because of some things they've done. But they're not, we're not a big club. And yet every big club passed on him at a young age. Yeah. So, from that, so that goes back to my developmental thing. He found himself in a place where they would develop him, which is what they did. And he's gone on, like I said, he, he, people predict he'll win the Ballon d'Or in the next year or so. Do you, think, do you think that's more of the development from the coaches, or is that just Jude's ability as a player? I think it's a combination of development and, coach, development and coaches constantly looking for that next best thing. Mm -hmm. And trying to, f and when they see it at such a young age, someone who's fast, right? Okay, that, that they're my best player. That gives me the best chance to win, right? And that's what they think about. So they're not developing the player; they just, oh, kick it into the corner, or kick it long, or play it long, or yeah, you go and dribble around people because they're the fastest. But um, and I see that a lot in different clubs around here. And you play against them, right? You play against, and you hear parents kind of talk like that as well because. They want to win. They want to win, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and it's fair. But I think if you want to develop your kids, keep going, keep going. then you're going to see like, <clears throat> you're going to see a better player at the end of the day that's more attractive, you know, to, I don't know if it's to colleges, because I think eventually colleges will wake up to, will wake up to seeing a better player come in. Um, and then you see that, an example, I use myself as an example. When I was a kid, I was fast, right? So I could easily say it. And I could, Dribble maybe the wrong word, but I could kick it and run. I could knock it past someone, run past them, and get by them yeah. just by f a young age. As I got older, that ca people catch up to you. Yeah, right? you know, you don't, you're not as fast, and you're not as because the other kids have got more athletic, and you start to see that, and you see it happen at youth level levels. But what you do see is the kids that know how to play, know where to be on the field, know how to move, where to pass. The you see those teams being super strong. And you can almost see it, like almost year by year, you can watch those kids as a team, as a unit, start to be more successful. And I've seen it even with the kids we have, you know, they're getting smashed two years ago to the place where they're, they hold their own and they're quite good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the thing I think in your, your soccer is, if, as long as parents like, would like to so, see their kids develop versus just winning, and, and if <clears throat> be in an environment where the kids play more, because if you're on a team and you are and you and your kids playing ten minutes and you're winning every game and you're happy with that, your child is not developing. Can't be because you have to play games to develop. Yeah. At some point, you can practice all day long, but you have to play. And <clears throat> do you think we need more games for kids? No, I don't think we need more games. I just think that. Uh, I think they need to... Just one game a weekend? Yeah. Or two games a weekend? Two, two games a weekend, yeah. Okay. I think these kids are... They can recover faster, for sure. But I think they need... I think there needs to be less intensity around the games, hmm. you know, to re reduce the intensity on the kid. Like, because... What is it? I know when I, when I played, and I know now from, from other guys we've taught, like other coaches that come through from England... Those academies that everyone talks about in the UK, like Liverpool or Brighton, those kids aren't playing in leagues. They just play each other. And they use those game settings to um, 
to practice things they've learned. As the kids get better, they'll start to move into tournaments. But you know, I think and I talked to Jamie, and we were talking about how when he goes, <clears throat> kids play every position. Mm. And they're expected to play every position, to learn every position, right? Here, you know, you find kids that are like, that's my right back, that's my left back. Who's my left back because he can use his left foot, right? Well, lefties are a rarity. Yeah, it's they nice are, to yeah, have yeah. a lefty. <laughs> but I think those, those kind of changes are, are starting to come. And I, I worked for a guy up in Oregon doing coaching, and I saw that, and I've seen the change 15 years ago where from a club soccer perspective with MLS coming in, they see a they see um, they see a farm, they don't see a farm system f- back then. Now they know there's a farm system, right? I think if you look at MLS today, and we've seen kids from the Fusion Club right go into Galaxy, right? And hopefully, we'll start to see girls from clubs go into LAFC and other clubs. You'd like to see that, right? I mean, because mm-hmm. I know Alicia Thompson was signed to a professional term, but she didn't come out uh, right out of out of a club so there's some good things happening there and I think that'll be that'll be really important and once that that really starts to grow that'll, that'll be a great developer I think for, for kids could you share any insights from all your experience being around like Figo and Mourinho you know all the different places you've been something that like a kid listening would appreciate like learning from them like you you have you know very unique insightful yeah. experience with those players and coaches something you've learned from them that you could share oh yeah yeah every single despite what kids see as a I think the thing you always remember as kids what you see on the TV what you see people front is an image they're cultivating right but I've been you know like I'll, I'll take away from it, I've had a chance to work with Beckham right at some point, go to his practices and that Manchester United team. I use the women's example, but I use that example. They're the hardest working people you, you could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. They listen to their coaches and they work incredibly hard. They, <clears throat> they do not take their talent um, for granted. They really, really put effort into it, into their game, and they, they study if they need to, and they work harder, they practice longer. And you hear stories about players being first one off and first one on and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're true. They're, and that's not just... I think they like to say certain players are the first one on on because of their style of game. But there's a lot like that. There are very... They are the first ones on and the last ones off the training field. And they work incredibly hard at their craft and they practice and they practice and they practice, right? Um, and I think the other thing they do is, which kids don't really grasp in, in this day is they spend an awful amount of time studying the game, mm. right? And how they have their position on the field and what they do. They're very good at it. And it's it's something that you can't... You always try to t- t- teach kids to run, you know, say, run more, right? Or work harder or put the effort in. And, and you sometimes, you know, say chase recovery runs and things like that. But you think, I think about this um, as a, maybe, maybe my example to this. And everyone like thinks that um, Wayne Rooney, when he played for DC United, right, runs all the way back, makes a tackle, collects the ball, crosses it, guy scores. So everyone's just amazed, like he ran back and made the tackle. Perhaps the amazement should be that a man who's 35 years old, who's supposed to be in a league just getting paid, mm-hmm. has the mentality mm. to run all the way back and make that recovery run and do it. It's not a like he didn't have to do that. I mean, he did have to do it in the in the game, but he, that's the biggest thing people forget. These guys work their tails off. Where do you think that mentality comes from? Uh, I think that comes from backyard soccer. Really? Yeah, I think that's the one thing. Just that, competing. Yeah, I think that's the one thing that, and we talked. You just mentioned about games. I mean, the backyard. When we were kids, we played soccer every night after school top of the street, in the street, mm-hmm. you know, kind of make up your own rules type of thing or you add nuances to the rules. That side of it, you know, you create a, you create a competitive edge. Um, you want to win, you want to have bragging rights, right? You know, I think all of that needs to needs to encourage. And you, you, I've seen, you know, I've seen and 
been with guys the I mean I've played backyard soccer with guys like the Balics and the Ronaldos right they want to go out and play in the streets and you're horrified at first that you they they want to do it because you think that they could get hurt they could get injured but no they want to go and play they just want to play and I think that side of it to foster that and nurture that in some way shape or form mm -hmm. and I know we I know there's like an upswell of like Sala here you know futsal oh okay that's all <laughs> yeah and you see that upswell and leagues forming again but it is a variant on, it is a little bit of a variant on backyard soccer yeah it's a bit more structured a bit more open but yeah for me backyard definitely all day long and every player that you know I, I ever came into contact with yeah pretty much was doing that at some point in their careers for a long and still does Hmm, that's interesting. I don't know if uh, I don't know if kids are doing that anymore, you know, or yeah. at least you know. I think of I've got two teams right now, and I just can't imagine all of them play soccer in their spare time. I imagine they do other things. Yeah, you know. And I think you know they often talked about right Xbox or whatever. You know, yeah. video gaming takes over, but even school, I, I got my kids. My kids will, you know, if I ask them what, if I ask my kids what, how was school today? Good. Every parent gets the good answer, right? Good. Yeah. And then you ask him, well, what do you do at school today? And the first thing, one of them says, oh, I nutmeg the kid. Or I did this, huh. or I sat him down. So I know, like, man will run out and play on the, at lunchtime and stuff. And there is a, quite a few kids that get out and play at lunchtime and just yeah. run around. Because it also, it also, um, when you play backyard, it creates this set. Uh, you know, you got to be creative, right? Yeah. yeah. Use your, there's no linesman. There's no referee. You you, you have to use your um, you develop your creative skills, right? I mean, like Gary Thomas, right? Then he came over and he did some things around chaos and all that kind of stuff. Reality is, backyard soccer is chaos all day mm -hmm. long, mm -hmm. right? And you know, people are changing goalies. You know, sometimes the goalie never uses his hands. Then he uses his hands and throw-ins so that kind of stuff for me is, is is and when you go to different countries when I traveled around to different places and worked with different players wherever you went there was always a variance of that going on even in even like in in the countries that you, you can almost guess right those countries are strong like you don't see it in China right you don't see it in other countries but you see in Africa if you go to Africa the kids are out there always, all playing. always out there doing yeah. something and I know it's a, they often argue it's a pathway out of, out of a, a situation, but I also think that it's why they've developed so well. Yeah. And they're having a good time. Yeah, they're having a great time. Yeah, I think there's a definite benefit of just being outside and playing. Yeah. Versus just being inside and on your phone or in front of a computer. Yeah, definitely. That, you know, kids don't realize and maybe parents don't realize and enforce and, you know, get them to go outside. Yeah, I mean, it's like when we always, <clears throat> I used to, like my parents as well, I didn't need, if I had a ball, I was, I was good. Because then I, if I had a ball and a wall, I was like, perfect. Yeah. Because then I could do all that kind of stuff, and I could practice all day long. And if I couldn't find a ball, then I could try to juggle and do everything. Mm -hmm. It didn't, never, it was really centered around that ball at times, and, and I never had to go outside and, and do anything different. Like, I think you're asking me, one of the things that, I could, went to Edgar David's house, right? Edgar David had soccer balls all over his house. Mm. Like, it, like, it's almost like a death trap at times, right? But there's soccer balls that have different sizes, you know, size threes, there's tennis balls, all over the house. And he would just dribble them around the house. Just go and make a cup of tea with a soccer ball juggling, right? Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, like you just, like, like, I can't tell my kids that kind of stuff because they, they want to do it in my house, right? You know? Yeah, well, <laughs> but but you see the it. way. <laughs> yeah, and there's also you know there's all those things like um, we were just talking about this the other day, like Pat, like you want to teach a kid how to kick a soccer ball properly, right? There's different things, but you ask him to put a tennis ball down on the ground and say, you know, kick over the tennis ball, then you'll strike a bigger ball better. And I said to Pat, yeah, but we all we all know that. Bobby Charlton's learn playing with a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we as kids we all learn how to 
we all, as kids, like, if we didn't have a proper soccer ball, then we had, we joke about it, right? We, we use tennis balls, right? Uh, for parents of kids listening right now, we'd have these fancy balls, you know? We had these, like, um, cheap plastic, almost beach balls, right? And uh, couldn't afford to get, an, um, couldn't afford to lose it. And then it would get misshapen in the heat. Mm. <laughs> so then it would kind of, you know, it would, we, we could do the knuckleball pretty easy with those <laughs> things. But, you know, it, it, you, you learn how to control those. And you learn all these different things from it. Yeah, it's just by kicking a ball around. It's the biggest thing I would tell any, even when we, with Pat and I, kids we teach, just ask them, like, you know, we get you for an hour. Like, you can't be, uh, an hour and a half, you, you got to yeah. play. Find a wall. You need more than Juggle practice. in your house. You know, yeah. Parents will like it, but juggle in the house, go outside, go in the garage, do anything. Like, when I was a kid, I used to, if I didn't have a soccer ball, like a balloon. Hmm. Well, yeah, kick. it's a lot easier to juggle yeah. a balloon. Yeah, you look good with a balloon. Builds Maybe I should bring some balloons to practice <laughs> yeah. for my kids who can't juggle yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all learned behaviors, yeah. All right, well, anything else you want to share before we no, wrap I mean, up? Like it's like been a, a, almost an hour. So sorry, Patrick, hour. yeah, I can ramble on for hours. No, no, no. Yeah, I've had all sorts of, like, you know, different experiences. With, like I said, like, you know, different players different situations. I consider it a privilege. Mm -hmm. I've been super lucky. Very lucky. Who's been your favorite person to meet? My favorite? Oh. I will say I've, I have, okay, oh. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I would say. Okay, you can give me three if you, if it's. I would say in this, pre, in this, not in this in order, I was lucky enough to meet Pele. Oh, and and now have a conversation a little bit about Pele, with Pele and for like ten minutes. Well, yeah, tell us. I got tell us more. Uh, Pele was a great. That was a great comment. That was good because uh, uh, you know sometimes people react to where you're from, English, Gordon Banks, but and for those who don't know, he made this save that is considered one of the world the best save ever. But Pele, um, he said. You know, sometimes he feels like he's only famous for his misses. Hmm. And Gordon Banks, there's a dummy he did in the World Cup game. There, he talks about those kind of things. He, he talked about that. And then he talked about um, being tough. We talked about, like, he, when Peel realized he was a good player, he, he basically got fouled and kicked all over the place. Yeah. And he talked about being tough and being resilient and under, then learning something he'd never had to learn, which was... Um, know when that hard tackle's coming. So that was that. I met, um, who else? Was, um, Maradona. Spent some, a little bit of time with Maradona. That was... Okay. And that was... Uh, I feel like we're just starting the podcast. <laughs> and Maradona was... When was that? 94 World Cup. So we're kind of his last one. At that time, trying to sort of... Going to do a like, quick deal, see if he'd wear some product. But we spent some time with him. Yeah, very similar in the sense that he was tired of being kicked around. Um... He, you know, he couldn't. How similar were they as people? Could you tell in those 10 minutes? Um, no, they're, they're different people. Um, Maradona is, I would say, kind of as, as you showed out. Incredibly more flashy. Yeah, yeah. But, but incredibly skillful. Um, humble, very, pretty humble guy, despite all of that at times, especially when around people who talk soccer. He didn't, he didn't talk about, he wasn't on oh, the best and this and that. He was pretty humble. Um, yeah, and he, he just talked about he, he'd been kicked all over the place. His body was taking a toll. It was hard for him. Um, <clears throat> he was stiff. You know, if he played a game on, it'd take him like a week to get over it because he'd basically been kicked everywhere. His muscles mm. were aching. And <clears throat> But this is like 94, you know, prior to like probably taking ice baths and things like that. But, yeah, he was... He was um, he was good. Uh, I mean, I've been, like I said, Alex Ferguson, some time with him. Um, I don't really know if I have necessarily a favorite. I think I always liked talking to the mixture of players that I met. You know, I really enjoyed um, old school players. I could, you know, guys that played a long time ago. Um, I was privileged to, you know, guys that played in the 50s, right, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, Tom Finney, I played like, 
big burly centre forward, um, and, and really those people were even more grounded, and more humbling. Bobby Charlton, uh, right. as, as an example, legend was, was a big you know boyhood hero, but really humble guy. You know, just didn't really understand what all the fuss was about. Really, you know, and understood that he could make a living from it and all that kind of stuff, but would tell you that he felt like, no, I wasn't even the best player on the team, you know? Hmm. That team of Dennis Law and people like that, he would talk about players he, 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 he played against, like Beckenbauer and people like that. So they, they're sort of different, um, but yeah, I, I, so I got, I've been lucky, like I said, to meet, met and hung out with like, the different, different players from around. I, I was trying to think of someone that I knew that was like, wow, they were very different and a little, little off, a little kooky. Well, is there, I mean... I can't, you know, we can't gloss over Pele and Maradona and Alex Ferguson so quickly. Like, did you learn, like, did they teach you anything? Did they, um, some, <clears throat> some little thing that, maybe the way they presented themselves, maybe they, you know, just little <laughs> things that you would never pick up from reading a book or seeing an interview versus being in person. Oh, yeah, I, for sure. All three of them was a level of intensity around what Yeah, you, intensity. Yeah, yeah, and curiosity. Curiosity. So every... Every, without a doubt, because I worked on the product side of it. So if I, so with Pele and with Maradona, there were product conversations about boots and product, right? And so the, how does that conversation go? You walk up, hey, I'm Andy, I'm a rep from Nike. Yeah. Would you like to try these boots on? We're trying to do research yeah. for our next product. Just get, the, like, ask you what you do, what was, what feedback do you like from that? Would, you know, in the case of Pele, it was a conversation around, what do you do? This is what I do for Reebok. I work on product, I work on boots. Oh, Where did you meet Pele? I met Pele so in the U.S. In, the US. Um, in uh, Was it the Cosmos? No. No, he wasn't. It wasn't the Cosmos. I worked in Phil- I think in Philadelphia. At a, it was a coaches convention. For, it used to be, still is probably, the NCA, NC2A coaches convention. And he was there? And he was there as a speaker at that time. Okay. But um, <clears throat> but I met him there, and we talked about, what do you do? Product. Because he asked me, I'm a coach. No, I'm not a coach. I'm doing a, at that time, doing product. And we talked about what kind of product are you doing. He, you know, we showed him some product that we did. For wow. Reebok. You're yeah, Reebok yeah. showed him some product we did. He was a mate. Like, for him, wow, it's different. Uh, lighter. Because mm. remember his progression thoughts around that fit we got into kind of that comment but he had a high level of curiosity really curious mm. um maradona exactly the same way we um like eager to learn yeah really curious about what not not curious like curious just about the product how it's made how it goes together you know what the benefits of it why did you do this so reebok we had like i said we showed him pump we showed him uh, some product then we'd made in italy um he was really curious Hmm. Right and and he was Alex Ferguson. I got met Alex Ferguson. Uh, walked him around testing lab and product in the same exact way. Super curious, hmm. like not in a, typically you can just be. Oh, I don't want to be here. I want to get out of here. Type of thing. Okay, I got it. Thanks. But no, he wasn't like that at all. He was really curious. They they. Why do you do this? What's that test for? What, well, and even in some cases. Um, how could you, ideas on maybe making it better, they, um, we tried this, and that's how, you know, like I said, he wasn't a fan of bladed product at that time. Yeah. And, you know, even when I, <clears throat> uh, way back, a similar period, worked with Bruce Rioch, who ended up being, he, was, he at one point was manager of Scotland, played for Scotland, played for Derby, he played for the Vancouver Whitecaps, and he talked about AstroTurf, um, field turf. Yeah, yeah. And he talked about boot constructions, and he talked, and look back, this is like mid-90s. We don't need studs. We need like multi-stud thing. And I found this. He talked about a Puma boot he found that was used in, could only get in South America. So they're really super curious, uh, all of them. And that's generally like those players that are really curious. You find out you usually have like a longevity in their careers. Now, that would be the one thing, all three of them. The curiosity. Yeah, but like I said, the same thing. Same thing with the women's national team. Um, yeah, I was just trying to think of like some oddities that I've players that you've had odd moments with. Um, Did you ever get like specific instruction from any of the players? Yeah, I've coaches, got like yeah, that? I've got some different ones, different 
I've got different experiences from like Mia on how she wants her boots to be stretched so they fit her a certain way and conditioned to being yelled at by the Nigerian national team because their, <laughs> their boots are horrible. <laughs> uh, their boots were horrible? Yeah, their boots were horrible. So you provided the boots and they No, I didn't provide them. Okay. <laughs> Thank God. It was in my early Nike days when I had to... So why'd they yell at you? They just didn't like the boots because their boots were badly made and they were getting... They were, prior to me, they were getting problems. And so oh, the, the Nigerian Federation was signed up by Nike. Nike provided all this product. The boots weren't, weren't but well you made. Fixed it. We fixed it, yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to be you know, yelled at that, I'm trying to think. Like, well, <clears throat> I think the, to sum it up, I try to think of when I did it. Maybe 90, had to be, I can't remember the exact year, but I spent time with them. Um, PSG, mm -hmm. um, which was then back then was uh, David Ginola was on that team. Uh, Deschamps, the, yeah, Fabian Batez. That's it was it was what it was a star star studied team, and um, to explain product to them, it was 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 a pretty surreal moment when they're all sitting in a dressing room, and I'm like the I felt like I'm a teacher, and it was. You know, you're, they're all sitting there waiting for you to say something, <laughs> and you're like, <clears throat> not laughing, not goofing off. So when we think about we have kids, right? You know, we're coaching kids, and you're like, hey, be quiet, sit down, eyes on me, pay attention. No, nope. right. they're all sitting there. Yeah, you know, they're not laughing, they're goofing they're off. They're waiting to hear like, what you're going to tell them. And as you start explaining the product to them, what's different, you pass it out, you ask them to try it on. Yeah, then it, it, that was probably a little bit of a surreal moment in in a sort of atmosphere of that was PSG's locker room yeah and PSG yeah it was just surreal because they were you know they weren't this is crap. you're like the manager for a second yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like not like this is bad product you can't use it I don't want to wear it I don't like your brand no just listening intently to the changes that you'd made um, trying it on oh yeah this feels great I think I did it before practice for those because back then they were head to toe Nike hmm. so it was before practice and you guys would go out and then be like, yeah, well, when you come back from practice, let's get your feedback. You know, we'll take the boots from you. We'll try to make changes. And I think after that one, it was pretty successful because we didn't have any boots given back to us. They, they kept them. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's it was a good. good. Sign. So that's probably like, yeah, that group. But yeah, like I said, I'm super privileged. Never a pretty lucky guy. Pat showed me a photo of... I don't know if we can talk about this messy shoe that you have. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Can yeah. you talk about how that came about and what? It's it's <clears throat> his Barca shoe and his World Cup winning shoe, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, because I work for Adidas right now, I'm right. pretty lucky in that I went to their archive, and so um, in their archive they uh, every every um, World Cup ball. From 1970. Is Adidas the World Cup ball? Yeah, I think they the whole time. So every time I've had done a World Cup ball, which I believe is from 74. Okay. They have it. They have one. They kept it. Game like used. from the final. Yeah, from the final. Game used. Game used, yeah. That's cool. So I had some pictures of that and they, they, they take them to games. But they have one from every World Cup final. It's pretty funny. And there's history behind each one. The tango, for those that... Yeah, I remember the tango. Yeah. And is it like a museum? Do they have a museum or is it just an archive? It's just an archive. They do museum pieces out, but they archive everything. So when I went there, um, <clears throat> we were just looking at different product and some of the guys was with, we started getting into some soccer stuff. We looked, saw Franz Beckenbauer's product, shoes, and one of the guys just kind of just said, yeah, okay, what messy stuff do you have? And they said, oh, yeah, sure. And they had um, his World Cup shoes he wore in the World Cup final, this last one in Qatar. And they had, um, which I think is the one I showed Pat the picture of. And then um, his I last... I if I can put that, if you send me a photo of it, if I can put it in the podcast. Maybe not, we'll see. I can show you the picture of it, I can send it to you. And then they had, um, what was the other one? Uh, his last shoe he wore for Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. They did, usually because they, you know, they all get a special something. And uh, his, 
I'm surprised he didn't want to keep his World Cup winning cleats. Oh, they are, they get they get a few pairs, but, but the ones he wore. Yeah, we we often think surprised that he hasn't kept them. Yeah, but he's probably just he's probably kept one. And they have the other one. Okay. It's usually how keeps the left one. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think though, I think that most of those guys will probably, especially someone like him, he's probably got two pairs. He changes out yeah. half time. Plus, how many shoes can you have, you know? Yeah, exactly. He's they, got a ton. They don't need that many. But, yeah, th- that was a really I, – I like the stars that go behind things. Though. I'm big into the <clears> – <throat> I'm big in the, the stories. I, I love the story. The product, I've seen – maybe it's because I've seen so much of it. Mm-hmm. But I think that, like, for example, this is like going back and it'll make kids and parents do a little history lesson. But I, I'll probably get the year wrong because I'm – but um, first World Cup, Germany won. They beat Hungary. I want to say. I want to say it was fifty eight, but it might be fifty four, and Hungary was dominant. And then they had Hungary had a centre forward called Puskas, who was the Ronaldo of that era. Mm-hmm. They literally just scoring goals for fun, and Germany, and that team was unbeaten, and Germany was not. Expected to win, not actually. Germany hoped they didn't get smashed like six, seven, nothing. Yeah. And what happened is, the German national, the German team d- developed a low cut soccer boot. We all know soccer boots today as low cuts. Sixty years ago, they were mid cuts. They were boots. Really? Boots. Hence the word boots. They were boots. Boots were actual boots. Boots were boots. I didn't know that. Came up, up and above your ankles. Ugh. Okay. And they were made of leather. Obviously made of leather, and they were very heavy, super, super heavy. And the Hungarian team had these boots, these, let's call them high-top boots. And Jeremy um, Adidas developed a low-top boot for that particular game. Just and for the final? Just just kind of for that game, for the final, yeah. And um, <clears throat> would it have been lighter? The story goes that the players felt like they weren't as tired, they could play better. Yeah. You know, fields are not what they are today. Muddy, rainy, wet, and Hungarian team tired, run out of steam, and they lost. And that was Germany's first World Cup. Wow. So I get to see those two, you know, next to each other. So that story as to why one, why there is a low top and why and a high top. Like, oh, that's a great insight right there. Yeah, that's it's kind like, of funny story. That's deep history. Yeah, yeah, that's why you know. And so anyway, you play that forward into today's world of like yeah really live example of like why you know light lightweight easy product generally kind of works yeah because i can remember you know they give that guy a raise a product development yeah they probably give him a raise <laughs> yeah but you know you talk about people today and they'll tell you like oh it's not protective enough this is one one i remember when lightweight boots me you know, those nike you know, vapor flies when they first came out yes you know they're they were basically textile right mm-hmm to all intents and purpose. And people go, oh, there's not enough protection. But reality is, based on that, what I just said, yeah, lighter is better. Like, and there's a lot, of, a lot of studies and data that will tell people, you know, the, the more tired you are, the more likely you are to get injured, so on and so forth. So, yeah. But yeah, the Nike archive. The archives are Adidas, yeah. Wow. All right. Well, yeah. thank you yeah. so much for uh, coming on here and sharing sharing your wisdom i we got to have you back on here i feel like we just <laughs> we just started no problem yeah yeah no problem yeah i can definitely uh maybe i'll try and get a couple of buddies from oh yeah we'll fill up this table get some more microphones yeah, i was yeah. thinking i was thinking we should have brought pat here but you know pat no, I, I also got a friend that like does it he's like lives in the east coast and he's a uh, he's done soccer and sports marketing on the other side of his whole career mm-hmm. and he's yeah He's done, I think. But has he met Pele? Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> then he's, he's welcome. He's the one that got me. He's the one that got me to meet Pele. He's the one. Oh, wow. Maradona. He spent time around a lot of players, sort of friends, in and around the business. He's a, he's an absolute um, character, for, for sure. For sure, yeah. Well, that'll be my new threshold for guests. Have you <laughs> met Pele? Yeah. You're welcome to come. If you have not... Go find another show. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.